Hello, I'm John Barron and welcome to Media Watch. And talk about a fabulous show with Sydney playing host to Indian PM Narendra Modi, who thrilled Australia's fast growing Indian population with a two day visit. Modi, Modi, Modi! East or West, Modi is the best! And Australia's PM thought so too, lighting up the Sydney Opera House and the Harbour Bridge in celebration. And in an effort to sum up the spectacle, the media seized on the same word. A rock star reception. At a rock star reception. A rock star reception for the Prime Minister. <laughs> And when you look at the reception our political leaders get, it certainly was. Revving it up was Anthony Albanese, who compared Narendra Modi to a real stadium rocker, Bruce Springsteen. Prime Minister Modi is the boss. Modi mania makes for good TV, but not everyone is a fan, as Seven News was reporting. Modi is also a polarising figure. Indian Muslim and Sikh communities not happy with his visit, protesting human rights violations against minority groups in India. And footage of that small but vocal protest was also getting a run that night on ABC and SBS. But if you're watching Nine News, it was all singing, dancing and cheering, starting aboard Modi Air. A specially chartered Qantas 737 flying the faithful from Melbourne to Sydney to see their PM give a speech at Homebush this evening. And even a current affair was all aboard the Modi Express. Everybody loves him, world over. He's not only the leader of India, he's the leader of the whole world. Next day, when Modi visited Admiralty House, a small group of protesters were on the streets. And that was again making news on 10, the ABC, Sky and 7. A small group outside protesting the slaughter of 2,000 Muslims when Mr Modi was Chief Minister of Gujarat State, bordering Pakistan in 2004. It's very clear that he does have blood on his hands. But for the second night running, Nine failed to mention any of that. And when our own Prime Minister was fronting up to the breakfast shows to sell his new BFF, including on the Today Show... What a rock, rock star is he, your new boss? Carl didn't press Albanese on India's human rights record. That was left to the ABC's Michael Rowland. Here he's accused of repressing his political opponents, he's accused of repressing the media, he's accused of discriminating against Muslims. Does any of that trouble you? And Seven's David Koch wasn't shying away, even using the T word. He discriminates against minorities, he's accused of watering down democracy. He sort of, he seems a... A bit of a tyrant. And when it comes to Modi's record on press freedom, it is pretty dismal. India is now at 161 out of 180 in the World Press Freedom Index, right down the bottom, below Afghanistan and dropping 21 places since Modi came to power in 2014. The low ranking due to violence against journalists, a partisan media and a concentration of media ownership. So it's no surprise, as Kieran Gilbert noted, that Modi kept the press at bay during his visit. No questions, you'll notice. He doesn't hold news conferences. He doesn't appreciate questions uh, from journalists. Not that you heard about any of that over almost an hour of Nine's coverage over four days. And the only time we heard about anti-Modi protests was this brief mention. Unfortunately, to quite a few protesters who I must say were very quickly moved on by New South Wales police. Unfortunate indeed. So why would Nine choose to run four days of Modi mania? Could it be for ratings and a chance to grab the attention of Australia's Indian-born population? We asked Nine why and if it thought its coverage was fair and balanced. Sadly, it declined to comment. Maybe Nine News really does love Modi, but it should love journalism more. Now to the policing scandal that has shocked the world. To Australia now, where there's been outrage after a 95-year-old woman was tasered by police, leaving her critically ill in hospital. Claire Nowland lived life to the fullest, even in her twilight years. Her death after being tasered by a police officer has shocked Australia. It sure has, and it has left media commentators struggling for an explanation. How could something like this happen? I can't understand it. I can't get my head around it. Mm -hmm. what, what happened? It's going at a slow pace, had a walking frame, five foot two, 43 kilograms. How, how does this happen? 
It's a good question. And it also left the New South Wales Police Assistant Commissioner fronting this awkward press conference. At the time she was tasered, um, she was approaching police. Um, but it is fair to say, at, at a slow pace, she had a walking frame. But she had a knife. And facing the biggest test of her career is Police Commissioner Karen Webb, who added to the media shock by announcing she would not watch the body cam vision of the incident. This story has gone around the country and around the world. It is shocking. It is. But one of the things that gripped everybody is your comment that you won't watch the body cam footage. Was that a mistake? Not at all, said the Commissioner. It's up to the investigators, leaving Sky's Sherry Markson to pass this judgment on Webb's leadership. The Police Commissioner, as you know, is utterly hopeless. And a so-called Nowland family friend wasn't impressed either, telling Wynn News... I think the Police Commissioner herself could have come to Cooma and met the family, helped them understand... Andrew Thaler, who appeared as a spokesperson for the Nowland family, was one of the first to reveal a taser was used on the 95-year-old before police admitted it and giving interviews with Australian community media and Sky News. It doesn't make sense. It can't be explained. And it's beyond anyone's expectations. As you understand it, as the family spokesperson, Andrew, what happened? Thaler's quotes on behalf of the family also appeared in print stories in the Sydney Morning Herald and The Guardian, which said he was speaking with permission from the woman's family. And days later, he was still giving updates on how Claire was doing to Sky News and ITV's Good Morning Britain. This story has caused outrage around the world and we can speak to a friend of Claire Nolan's family, Andrew Thaler. But who is Andrew Thaler and is he really a friend of and spokesperson for the family? This footage on his live Facebook stream suggests he's not. That's the family. That's the family. Live on camera threatening to run me over. You've got to be joking. This family is sick. Who is that? So are you Nolan family, are you? Get out of it. Take him away. Get the... Take him away. That was filmed by Thaler last Wednesday, on the night Claire Nowland died. The man lunging at him appears to be one of Claire Nowland's sons, and it's pretty obvious they're not happy with their so-called family spokesman, not least because they say he's not their spokesman at all, with another of Claire Nowland's sons, Michael, telling Media Watch... I am Claire's eldest child, and on behalf of the family, I advise that Andrew Thaler is not related to the Nowland family and is certainly not the family spokesperson. And Michael Nowland, who is furious at what's unfolding, had this message for the media. We would much appreciate you not accepting any correspondence or commentary from Andrew Thaler in regards to the Nowland family. It's all very strange. So what is going on? Andrew Thaler told Sky News ten days ago... I am trying to stand between the media and the family to give the family the space. And he says he started doing that after one of Claire's 24 grandchildren, who is a friend, had media appear at her house. Yes, my friend had media turn up in her front yard and that shocked her and that rattled her and I stepped in and shut that down and protected her. But before quoting him and interviewing him time and time again, should the media have done just a little bit of homework on his background? According to Nationals MLC Bronnie Taylor, the answer is yes, telling 2GB's Ben Fordham that Thaler, a former local political candidate, is... ..a horrible person and who is a bully and who has been banned from things like council meetings... And she added that when Thaler began appearing in the media as the family friend and spokesman... I rang the journalists of the different mastheads and I said, have you checked this with the family? You need to check your sources. And indeed, if you do check on Thaler, 
the results are revealing. The Canberra Times reported that Thaler escaped a conviction last year for intimidating a staff member at a rural fire service office despite pleading guilty. He had been on a good behaviour bond for assaulting police at the time of the offence. Four years before that, police were called to remove him from a council meeting in Cooma where he was allegedly causing a nuisance. Thaler's record, it seems, is well known to local media and local politicians and, without going into detail, the opinions offered on his character were not complimentary. So, what is his game? Claire Nowland's granddaughter Kylie confirms to Media Watch that she did ask Thaler to speak on her behalf, but Thaler goes further claiming that he has been given the green light by Claire's daughter Gemma a claim we have been unable to verify. And in this weekend Facebook post, he attacked the Nowland family for asking him to stop. She told me, do not let anyone stop you telling this story. Get it out and get it wide. Claire's daughter. Now, I shouldn't have to reveal my sources or reveal my permissions. But if this stupid family it's going to bring a fight and attack me and defame me and encourage all the creeps and cretins and scum, then I will bring the fight back with more truth. Thaler paints himself as a champion of Claire Nowland and says he represents all grandmothers in nursing homes. But it is obvious that Thaler's public statements are causing the Nowland family distress, especially when he responds to their requests to stop representing them like this. Stand down, stand down, you're destroying the family. No, you're destroying yourselves. I'm stronger than all of you and I am but one man. It is a mess and it looks like Andrew Thaler won't stop. This is one man we think the media would do best to avoid. And finally, let's cross to a giant new gold mine dividing a community in the New South Wales Central West. McPhillamy's gold mine at Kings Plains near Blaney, slated to extract up to 60.8 million tonnes of ore and produce up to 2 million ounces of gold over the proposed 11-year run. For more than a decade, locals in Kings Plains between Orange and Bathurst have been divided over the project and from calls for public forums to furious apiarists and cranky koalas, local papers have naturally been giving a voice to concerned residents. But two months ago, the battle was won by the developers. After years of debate, a three-day public hearing and over a thousand submissions, today the Independent Planning Commission giving Regis Resources the green light. That decision has obviously left plenty of people unhappy and 11 days ago, the Blaney Chronicle gave over page three to one whose home, or should that be castle, will be affected. A man's home is his castle and Anthony McIntosh has called his King's Plains Castle home for almost 20 years. But following the approval of the McPhillamy's Gold Project, his castle might come crumbling down. Anthony McIntosh lives about two kilometres from the proposed mine site and, according to the Chronicle, he's facing a difficult decision. To move away and avoid the noise, air and water pollution that may be created by the mine, or to stay at the home he's spent the past two decades building and accept the consequences. And the journalist spent enough time with McIntosh at his King's Plains castle to note that he had... Over 50 solar panels, a 12-metre lap pool, sheep and chickens, as well as strawberry and raspberry bushes. So, where is all of this going? Well, for starters, nowhere in the 700-word story was there any comment from the company planning to build the mine, which it says will bring 710 jobs to the region. But also missing was one key fact, because Anthony McIntosh is the journalist's father. Whoops. And that's a clear conflict of interest that should have been mentioned, especially when the story is so clearly and completely on his side. Now all of this is in jeopardy due to the environmental concerns that have been raised by the mine. We asked the paper why a journalist was allowed to interview her own father without disclosing it and without getting comment from a company he's criticising. Rod Quinn, the editorial director at Australian Community Media, told us... 
This story appeared in the Blaney Chronicle as a result of an error by a print producer. It had not been approved for publication and there were no plans for it to be printed. The byline journalist was not responsible for the story being published and it would be unfair and inaccurate to suggest otherwise. The journalist has ACM's full support. Well, we're glad they didn't throw her under the bus. It is now almost two weeks, though, since the story appeared in the paper. But ACM has still not disclosed the conflict or offered an apology. Rod Quinn says that will be rectified in the next edition. We reckon readers deserve it. And that's all from us for tonight. Don't forget Media Bites on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. But for now, until next week, goodbye.